Welcome to another debrief. Uh, it is uh, we're both we both have really dark cameras today. Where are you right now? <laughs> I'm in uh, Colorado. I'm in a hotel room, so I don't know if you can see that. It's actually a really nice hotel. It's got like a kitchen uh, and stuff like that, which uh, has been pretty nice. But yeah, I'm in Colorado traveling for the CWA um, annual Climbing Wall Association industry kind of annual summit <laughs> trade show. I'm very uh, jealous. I'm sad I'm not there. Yeah, uh, next year Plastic Weekly needs a booth. A booth. Uh, <laughs> Lord, I, every once in a while, I was actually I did have an idea for for like a panel for next year because it's the anniversary of something. But we can talk about that uh, yeah. later. I don't know what I would do in a booth. Just like let anybody come in and just do some random interview on every person. It is a good place mm. to meet to do interviews with kind of anybody and everybody. Sure. And, and yeah. I know that's um, something that the power company, um, Chris Hampton, you know, he's there and he's yeah. chatting with people. It's an awesome opportunity. He gets like a year's worth of interviews out of going there. And it drives me nuts because I like I, I he does an excellent podcast, but I, I think he's like just sometimes he'll he'll like come right up to a, a topic and then he like won't do the next part that I'm really hoping for. And I think it's just because um, like, especially from a gym management side or whatever, I think I've spent more time recently doing that than he does. Like he's a coach. I'm not a coach at all. Yeah. So I don't listen so much for the coaching content. I listen more for like the gym content. And so I feel like his, his interviews just miss my personal point of uh, interest. So it makes me want to go down there and, and get those other uh, answers. But anyway, yeah. He should, uh, he should have you on Chris Hansen. If you're watching this. I don't know. We're two people that would just ask questions of each other constantly. <laughs> it, it, would, it wouldn't be clear who the interviewer was probably at that point. Um, yeah. My, my, my room is dark because I'm sick and I don't want to see like the light of day right now. So I'm just, I think it also like makes me look better because otherwise the room behind me is really bright, but I have no light on my face. So this right. is the, this is the mode of, of the video from here on out. Anyway, if I, if I'll, I have to, I'll, I'll say that I don't know what time my checkout is. So if any, if, if I end up getting knocks on my door <laughs> and they're like, you gotta leave, then like, cut this off. That'd be, uh, that'd be a great really finish. <laughs> okay. So first of all, um, I'm, I've just been sick all weekend. I didn't watch semifinals, so I'm going to have like not that much to talk about there except from like the women's blowout. Um, did you get to see any of that stuff? I did. I watched the semifinals. To be honest, I did not have a chance to rewatch it. So I, ha so I have the thing that is fresh in my mind is the, are, you know, the finals. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I, I mean, I have some There's notes. There's so on much the to talk about in the finals. We probably there don't are, have yeah. To, yeah. I don't, uh, let me, look, let me just flip through real fast yeah. uh, and see what the semifinals um cool well while you're doing that i'm just gonna point out that for like normally we do a recap of like how the canadians and americans did not a particularly noteworthy weekend for team canada at least uh and we only sent three people elena yip wasn't even there um i imagine they're just getting ready for the next stage of the season but sean mccall ended 21st lucas yushida 27th and jay Hollowatch had a bitch of a weekend finishing 79th that's a rough rough trip to europe for her for jay but uh, anyway, they'll be in Vail next or two weekends from now. So hopefully they can. He made uh, he made finals in Vail three, three or four years ago. We had two Canadians in a finals. I think it's the only time that's happened. It was actually a seven man finals in Vail that year. Uh, but anyway, how did uh, how did you guys do? Yeah, speaking of Vail, it's going to be interesting because that's where the Canadians and the Americans typically, obviously because of the location, typically do pretty well. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a fun. I hope it's a fun way for you and I to kind of cap off the bouldering season yeah. with some like really strong uh, American and Canadian performances. Uh, in terms of the semifinals, that's actually. It's a good point to also talk about how the Americans did because the the highlight was um, let me see look at my results here Alex Johnson was the highest um, place of any of the Americans she was she made it to the semifinals she actually had a pretty good showing in the semifinals she got two zone holds she didn't get any tops but she got two zone holds and because the boulders were so difficult, she was actually in the lead for a good chunk of the semifinals in the women's division. Uh, she didn't end up making it into finals, obviously, but uh, I think Alex John, I think she ended up in 10th place overall. Uh, Kyra Condi was in 21st, tied for 21st. She just barely, I think it was one spot, she just barely missed advancing into uh, semifinals. Uh, Ashima Shirishi was 20, tied for 25th. Sienna Kopf was tied for 45th. And Brooke Rabatou was tied for 51st. And in the men, the highest was Zach Gala, who tied for 49th. 
Sean Bailey was tied for 53rd, and I want to talk a little bit more about um, Sean Bailey a little later. Josh Levin was tied for 59th, and Dylan Barks, a uh, rough day for him, tied for 97th. So, oh. um, not the best showing for the Americans, um, aside from Alex Johnson and Kyra Kondi, who almost made it into semifinals. Everybody else, um, kind of rough, kind of a rough time in Munich, but yeah, Vale, Vale is on the horizon, so... That's that's the the savior. Yeah, can you imagine yeah. if if next weekend we're, or uh, two weekends from now we're actually talking about Americans and Canadians and not Yanya possibly sweeping a season? That would well. So it's interesting because last year at Vale uh, in the women's division, Alex Johnson or, or sorry, Alex Puccio won mm-hmm. um, out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, and uh, you know Puccio, she's not she she has not been traveling on the World Cup circuit. No. But she did. An American did win last year, and in the men's division, Sean Bailey placed second at mm-hmm. Vail last year. So there's there's a good precedent um, with that competition for the Americans doing well. So there I, is, yeah, there is some magic in Vail yeah. for sure. We'll see what. And yeah. again, uh, I think Yanya said that's the one place she's never made finals uh, before in the post uh, post interview uh, this weekend. So hey, if things come together, the dream could be shattered, and we could have. Finally, like a medal for an American or a Canadian, who knows? I I thought this weekend there was a there was a, to be honest there was a a brief moment when I thought that Fanny Gibear was mm-hmm. maybe going to spoil the party for Yanya, uh, and it's like Charlie Bosco I think or Mike Langley one of them said on commentary you know Fanny she finished with four tops in the final she topped everything it's like yeah. wow, what else can you do <laughs> you yeah know? no it's like that she 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 has a in terms of tops, a perfect round, and it's still not enough to beat Yanya. <laughs> well, that's uh, you mentioned that, and I'm just gonna just gonna go out there and just say my favorite problem of the of the event was actually women's number two because that was the first time we got to saw got to see uh, Yanya fall, and it left us at a point where after two uh, problems, Yanya and Fanny were tied, and and for the first time. It like well probably all season since Maringen I felt like wow this you know so this might be up in the air and of course at the end of women's number three it didn't matter anymore Fanny took three attempts and Yanya flashed it and it looked like it was just gonna play out the way it always does but yeah that that uh, seeing not so much seeing Yanya fall but on the attempt that she actually you know what I've got the video here screw it let's just play it this is we're like totally going out of order anyway so this is uh this is women's number two actually it was a really pretty problem as well. Um, but uh, she fell in the, kind of in the flower sequence up here earlier on. But when she gets to the top, it's a very fallible top. Like, um, you know, it, it wasn't perfect. Um, so I, I feel bad making us go out of order and already talking about uh, our favorite problems. But this one, honestly, the moves on it don't get me psyched. Like, uh, there was another problem that I think I enjoyed enjoyed more as a competition climb. But this was the one where... I think I felt the most emotional response to, um, just because of how she deals with actually securing the top. Uh, we're almost there. We're almost there. We're gonna do this little flip here, change our hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're gonna do a bit of a launch, and then she's just gonna like hang off her fingers for like ten seconds, and she just keeps missing the feet, and she's dangling off like three straight fingers in her right hand. She's just getting wrecked on this finish hold. Finally lands it. But I. So anyway. That was really cool, just getting to see somebody that strong, like having to play around a little bit to hold it. So I like that moment a lot. That that was a good problem. It's just funny. This speaks to how dominant Yanya has been when we are, it, when the thing that excites us or, or whatever you want to call it, for lack of a better word, <laughs> yeah. is the fact that she actually <coughs> fell once on a problem. It's like oh, she actually yeah. didn't. She did not flash it. That's like you know the fact that we. That's one of the takeaways that that is stuck in our mind at the end of a final. Uh, it, it just it, I mean, that just speaks to how awesome Yanya is this season. Yeah, it is. It's it, those are the defining things where you're like, okay, this is clearly somebody's era, right? Like probably not since. Yeah. And I'm sure has there been like a climber where you are surprised when they fall or when they don't actually um, uh, win or something like that. So, yeah, there's yeah. and I we're getting to a point and I want to bring this up, like especially in the broadcast, there are so many superlative stats that are swinging around. Like if you go rewatch the finals broadcast, the number of stats that the commentators had on like medal count across like all these different disciplines was unreal. And I was just getting lost in all of it. So I've, I've been trying to like really figure out, okay, what things do I care about? Which things are really impressive to me? What are the really 
important stats or important achievements that I'm trying to like get a grasp on in my head. And I'm not sure overall medal count or overall wins count is one that I care too much ab about just because it, it is always changing in the context of like your medals is different. Some people won them all in one discipline. Some people won them across multiple disciplines. Some people won them across 10 years. Someone like Yanya has won them across effectively three years. So medal count is kind of like messing with me. Um, but yeah, that all those stats were were nonstop crazy. I think the big achievement that we're now looking forward to is next competition if Yanya does win Vale. It's the first time somebody swept a season, although there's caveats to that. And I think it's also she ties herself uh, with the most, or she'll she'll be the person with the most back-to-back -back bouldering World Cup wins. She'll overtake Sandrine Leve, who I think was at sixth or seventh if you include her World Championship win. Yanya right now is at seven if you include her World Championship win. So anyway, Yanya can be the most back-to-back -back boulder medals. Uh, I should double check that in my little book. Give me, yeah, you, you say something cool while I'm- Yeah, well, the line. interesting thing is that if, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but if Yanya does win next week and sweeps the bouldering, mm -hmm. uh, which we should point out, she essentially points wise she has already swept it because well, so she she's she's won her. she's won the season championship like that is true like that's done right. now so she has won the season but in terms of events nobody has ever won every bouldering event in a every boulder world cup in a season right and it's kind of we're getting into like real technical area here because she so for people that might not know they they take your score from all the competitions they drop your lowest one um and so essentially if yanya would sit out of veil and mm -hmm. not participate um she you could still say she swept every she swept the season in terms of every comp that she participated in right well, uh, yeah well yes but i <laughs> i think like i think the two things are nobody has won every boulder world cup in a season before right, right. so that's like that's one um, I don't think anybody has locked in the um, World Cup or the like the World Cup season championship. It's so the terminology for this is super fucking weird, right? Because there is a Boulder World Cup ranking and you earn that ranking based on points you earn from each World Cup. And then at the end of the season, those points together give you like the Boulder World Cup championship or you win the world cup season the the terminology is really hard for me to like parse but anyway nobody has won every single world cup in a season before people have come close anna was one away and in fairness when anna was one away it was a season of eight events and she missed one of them so she won seven events in a season yanya and most can win six right so there's a caveat as to how important this is it'll still be a superlative thing. You can still say she's the first person to do it, but somebody else has won more Boulder World Cups in a season. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of crap to like figure out. It's kind of hard to, you need infographics. Somebody, we need some like infographic designer to put this shit together, especially for the metal count stuff. Yeah, and another aspect <coughs> that you, you always hear about as well in other sports is the competition in different eras was not nearly as steep as it is now. Um, I, I would, I mean, I think in just in the last few years, the amount of talent competing in climbing is uh, I, I, obviously there's always been talented people, but because climbing is kind of increasingly popular, competition climbing meaning, um, I just think the level of talent that Yanya is beating um, is is more impressive than probably talent on the whole in previous eras. So I have an. I'm trying to parse through this because I have some issues with that. Uh, so like there's basically two climbers. If we just let's focus in on female bouldering, right? Like Yanya hasn't done the lead season yet. So let's stop talking about like that. Let's just talk about bouldering and let's just talk about it within the context of women. Frankly, there have been no impressive male um, uh, eras of bouldering. It's always flipped back and forth between winners. But for women, there are basically like three definitive eras. The first one is Sandrine Levey uh, in the early 2000s. The second one is Anna Storr in like 2013, creeping a little bit earlier and later. And then most recently is Yanya Garnbrett. So Sandrine Levey, back when she was climbing, I'm just going to try and find one of the comps that she would have uh, won. So I've just pulled one up uh, from this era. Um, she was competing in fields of approximately 20 climbers, right? Like 20 female climbers. That's a crazy small field and bouldering was not very developed 
so I should silence my phone. Um, and so I totally agree with your statement. Now, I wasn't conscious of climbing at that point. I don't know how strong Sandrine LeVay is. I know she won a bunch of seasons. She won a ton of World Cups. Um, but the field was much smaller and the sport was much less developed. And if you go back and you look at that root setting, you say, okay, yeah, that's fairly basic root setting. These problems don't look hard in the way they are now. But if you look at the Anna Stor, uh era, which is really only about five years ago, the setting is approximately the same in terms of style. I'm not enough of a root setter to judge how much the difficulty has changed. But the one thing that is a kind of a stark contrast, especially when you look at a comp like this weekend, is Anna Stur, when she was winning gold medals, and again, the season where she won seven out of eight Boulder World Cups, that finals was like Anna Stur, Melissa Neve, uh, or Melissa Leneve, <laughs> uh, Verm, Alex Puccio, Katka Salvine, Shauna Coxie, like an all-star lineup of boulders, right? Week in, week out. And Anna was winning every single one of them. The one that she didn't win, she lost by an attempt, right? Like she just fell off a start move once. That that was like a crazy stacked lineup. And now look at this season right now, right? <clears throat> so Yanya is a crusher. She's clearly fucking amazing. But the competition she's going against is... Okay, Akio Noguchi, who was present um, in the... I should have mentioned Akio as one of uh, Anishter's big um, uh, big rivals as well. That was... a uh, um, I was forgetful. But look at Yanya's field right now. Is Akio pretty much at most of the comps. Miho would be another one, except she's been injured and barely been there. Shauna, except she's barely been there and she's injured and she's just like stopped her boulder season now so she can focus on lead. So those are your like big two of them, Miho and Shauna, mm -hmm. that have just totally bailed. Then look at the rest of the field. You have Fanny Gibert, who's kind of appearing only recently, has yet to win a Boulder World Cup. And then after that, you go down the list and it's like a revolving door of people that don't have many bouldering accomplishments, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to Anna Stur's level, you have people that were like multi-time medalists competing against her every single week whereas right now there is <clears throat> a, a much larger gap and you don't have that same level of accomplishment that's tearing away at Yanya now that said maybe you know maybe uh, or Yanya stands out that much more and that's why she's crushing everybody maybe it doesn't matter what her competition is and in favor of that argument is when you look at the scores from semifinals actually I've got them here this was like a, a, a pretty good repudiation of the argument I'm trying to make. I'm just going to pull this up. This was semifinals, right? So Yanni Garnbrett, four tops. Evgenia Kazbakova, who nobody has heard of until this weekend with a single top, and then nobody else got tops. So Yanya flashed two problems, got four tops. Look at the other legendary names. Like, look at Fanny Gibert. She didn't top anything. Look at <clears throat> uh, Jessica Pills. Didn't top anything. Look at Alex Johnson. She's a Boulder World Cup winner. Didn't top anything, right? This is the best argument for saying that Yanya is far and above the best boulderer out there, possibly ever. But you didn't get to see it against Akio or Shauna or Miho. So there's like missing information. It's really hard to make this argument. This would have mm -hmm. been such a good event to see those other three climbers at if they were here because this semifinals round looked like a total like just thunderdome of bouldering. Yeah, I think we're, you know, we're actually, it's fun to play devil's advocate with this stuff, but I think you and I are kind of in agreement in a way, which is we acknowledge that Yanya is having what could be the argued as the greatest single season of any competitor. Yep. Uh, but I think With, both, there's a lot more to go. That's the thing, right? Like she could yes. dominate lead. But I think you and I, oh, well, that'd be something. <clears throat> if she, mm -hmm. she would sweep lead also after sweeping bouldering. Like, yeah, I can see it. Like I can yeah. totally imagine that. Um, but I think you and I are on the same page, which is let's acknowledge her for having a great single season. Maybe even whatever you want to say, legendary, greatest ever for a single season. But let's kind of slow our roll a little bit uh, on saying that she's the all-time great absolute end of story. Yeah, yeah and I, I don't want to slow it too much, but I, I, I'm i just acknowledging in my head that I don't know how to compare this generation from the generation five years ago or um, – 20 years ago in the case of, or 15 years ago in the case of Sandrine LeVay. And that's where I think like getting those historical root setters, those guys that are still in the scene, like Laurent Laporte and Jackie, those guys that would have been competitors and setting um, and have been around forever. Like 
I think it's a really important conversation to start having because like when you're like just divvying out goat status based on like a recency bias, that's kind of lame. And so I think somebody needs to start looking at, okay, Anna has the incre these incredible achievements. And I, I think we should just, I like, I'm not saying everybody be cautious or shut up or stop, stop having a party about it, but I think it's time to start actually debating this. And I, from a statistical point, the best I can do is look at performances in the past. After that, I need somebody with a better eye of root setting, a better eye of coaching, a better eye of movement, because I can't judge those things very well myself. And some of this is unanswerable. Like it's you can't we can't say, <clears throat> excuse me, how uh, how Anna Storr would would do if she was competing in her prime now. Or let's even go back further before the IS, uh, you know, IFSC. Let's go to like the Robin Herbisfield era in mm -hmm. like the you know early nineties. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, and there was when, no bouldering back then, no bouldering. so you have no idea. Right, but if you would somehow have Robin Herbisfield from then with with that raw talent able to train and compete and be in, in her prime nowadays, um, you know, how would she compare to Anya? There's no way to answer this, and you can't ever answer it. And that's why these mm. debates go on forever. That's why they're kind of fun, but that's also why they get frustrating because you, you're never going to come to a consensus probably on any of this. Yeah, you know? so I think, I think the point I just want to leave people with is like, most likely Yanya will overtake everybody in the medal count, in the world championship count, in the season winning count, like just based on her age and how well she's been performing and how few challengers there are, she's probably going to overtake everybody in those like raw metrics. So we should probably just like see if those things are actually comparable. Um, start taking a look back at those old videos of, uh, of Anna winning those events and seeing what that field was like and, and, and try and just decide like, are they comparable? You know, is Yanya clearly better just because we think that root setting has gotten harder over time. I think it's time to like, think about that, pull out the old, the old, uh, <coughs> um, playbacks and stuff and, uh, and take a look at the problems. Like how hard do you think the problems from this Munich were compared to Munich 2013, for example? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a perfectly, um, healthy kind of question to start, uh, asking. It's not anything against Yanya. It's just, if you're, if you're debating for the title greatest of all time, you better have some like info before, uh, before putting that out there. But yeah. yeah. Speaking of somebody else, that's like greatest of all time, but can't fucking find a bonus on problem number four. I just want to, I, I don't want to ruin this episode by complaining about the new scoring system, but I was really pissed after the men's final where Adam flashed the first three problems, which nobody else did. And then he couldn't find zone on number four. Jakob does manage to find it and Jakob wins. Nothing against Jakob Schubert. Adam was the stronger climber this weekend. Like, can any, I don't know. Can anybody debate that? Would, do you want to debate that? No. And, and Jakob even kind of mentioned that in the post, <laughs> in the post competition, you know, the post win interview. Um, he kind of said that like that he, Andre was maybe a little stronger, uh, I, I, so I think at the, at the center of this, this debate or at the center of your frustration is do flashes, should flashes count more or be more, um, waiting, weighty in the scores than a zone, right? That's essentially what it comes down to mm -hmm. because, uh, because Andre, he flashed the first three problems, um, which Jakob, I don't remember. He didn't flash all three of them. I don't know if he, he flashed he, any of them. He didn't flash any problems at all. He didn't top number one. Okay, so so Andra flashes all three. Jakob does not, but Jakob stays in the hunt. And then on the final problem, Andra can't get the zone, and Jakob can, so Jakob wins. Yeah. And so so, it, so it's essentially like those oh, 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 those flashes, you know, for better or worse, like they count for nothing. It's like it's. He, it was impressive, but in terms of the scores, it was the zone hold that really mattered, not the flashes. Yeah. Um, and so I don't, I don't want to dig too much into this because I recorded an episode like a year ago with a few other people when they changed the scoring. I'll put a link to it in like the description or, or there will be a little box in the top of the video. Uh, but this was Jakob topping uh, men's number four on his third try. But just the Jacob fact that he got zone on this climb was enough to give him the win. Here's Adam on number four. And this was kind of 
sad to watch because I think Adam was feeling really good. He had just flashed three problems. He was clearly in line for the win. And then he spent like five attempts throwing himself at this dynamic move and just could not stick the zone. It was really rough to watch, watching the uh, the win just like fall out of his hands. That yeah, sucked, he, man. He, he just never looked, I mean, he's not known as being a dynamic climber in particular. Um, he just never looked, after that first attempt, um, he, I was, it's like I, I thought to myself, oh, wow, he like, he looked really far off on that. It like, like it didn't even look like, uh, like he almost secured the zone. And mm -hmm. so I, right away I said, oh, this, this opens up the competition a lot because mm -hmm. this, this, this route is not going to be a gimme for Andra. And, and it, uh, obviously it wasn't at all. Um, but what's interesting is you and I were messaging each other. I think after the after the four minutes was over, I think Andre actually thought he had won. Yeah. Though, uh, and I and beca and you can kind of tell for one thing because he always is he's known as a competitor who wears his emotions on his sleeve, and 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 he <laughs> didn't seem upset at all. Like when the four minutes was up, and it's like, oh, I didn't get the zone. Oh well, you know, he was all smiles. Yeah. It was not. It was not the characteristic on Andre <clears throat> frustration that yeah. you would expect if he if he had realized that he basically just lost the competition for himself by not securing that zone. Um, so yeah. Well, you're, the, you're the right. moment the moment that got me was you know how they do like the podium before the podium. So after the round is over, they just get the guys to stand in order. They announce their names. Yeah. Uh, and then they go on to the women's climbing, even though there will be an official podium later. So they were standing in podium order with Jakob in the middle because he was first, um, Andre on the left because he was second, and then Yan in third. And after they announced Yan's name and they were about to announce second place, you could see Adam like like motioning with his hands, like telling Jakob that they should switch sides. And then the announcer like had to say something to Adam. And then he just like yeah. lost his his like joie de vivre immediately realizing he actually came i think that's what happened but that uh, yeah. was like rough to watch. i just i just remember as soon as this yeah exactly and i i remember even before you and i had messaged when the four minutes were up i thought to myself wow that's very uncharacteristic that andre seems so content with with missing the victory by one zone mm -hmm. hold yeah um and uh you know you'd expect normally to hear him you know scream and kind of stomp around and stuff as he as he does and we love him for that we love him because he 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 is that emotional uh, so it was just surprising that he was <laughs> so cheery after yeah the, after losing the competition <laughs> uh, yeah yeah so, no. uh yeah it was an interesting it was interesting for me this is something that i wrote about in my in my recap um that the beginning of this season started with Andra, kind of the same narrative, right? With Andra coming to that the the final problem in Mayringen, um, if he does it, he wins, and he's the last one out, you know. And he and he cruises it, and he gets the victory. And so it's almost like this. Now that the season is is nearing its end, this was the chance for us to kind of have that bookend, the same mm -hmm. sort of scenario, bookending bookending the season, uh, and. It's something just felt kind of right about that. It was like, yeah, it's it just narratively it makes sense that this is how this comp is going to end when the Meringen one, so, you know, so long ago uh, ended the same way, and and the fact that it didn't was kind of a really fun. I mean, not not that we want to relish in Andra's defeat, but it, it but it was a fun swerve for us watching it. Because I, I had think... no fun on the Andra thing. I was like instantly pissed. It ruined. Like I was. Fortunately, the women's round made up for it, and I left the comp with like a tear in my eye and just like happy about everything. But the the men's round, like I wasn't happy at the end of it because of the scoring. Because of yeah, the, because, because yeah. like and again, like I mean, the rules are the rules, but they only changed the rules like a year ago, and I'm I, I disagree with it, and I think it took a medal away from somebody who's like a dominant motherfucker of a boulderer. Like he just like all those problems where everybody was having a difficult time with problem number one, where nobody else could top it at all. Like everybody was just getting flummoxed. They would take one attempt. Actually, I got a video of Adam on this. This one's not going to show the full case. This is Adam 
flashing men's number one. Basically on this, everybody would do the first move and they would just be exhausted, right? Like nobody could do a good second attempt on this. And Adam just cruised this thing. He made every move look better. And in the commentary, they mentioned this as well. But this was just like a masterclass on this guy has perfectly mastered how he uses his body in any situation. Like the, the movement, the placing of his hands and his feet was incredible. It was as efficient as possible, which it just made the other guys who are pro climbers look like amateurs on some of these moves. It was unreal. Yeah, this was actually, now that we might as well say it while we're watching this, this was my favorite problem of the whole competition. Uh, I love the aesthetics of it, the gut, kind of the guppy grips on the big squadron volumes. Uh, I loved how you kind of started sort of boxed in uh, and then you kind of worked your way out to the perimeter and there was like some, some lie back moves and stuff and then I really liked, I mean obviously the story with that problem was exciting how nobody could top it and then Andre as the last competitor uh, tops it but I think, I also loved how I think it was Alexei Rubstov maybe who, um, who like touched the top but he couldn't mm -hmm. secure it and I just always like it when a problem, ha when a boulder has um, a top that's not a gimme. It's like they can touch the top, but can they secure it? I like when those are those are yeah. two different. That, when that's an important question in the in the results. Uh, and this was, uh, as Alexi proved, this was a really difficult uh, top to secure to snag. Um, I, and look at it there. I just it's just a beautiful boulder, right? It's like sort of this upside down. Uh, kind of outline of a triangle and then there's these three volumes at the top it's um that's a great shot particularly with the the boulder to the left of it too the kind mm -hmm. of the flower boulder and then you got the 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 boulder to the right uh, just some phenomenal root setting i think I, I, and you can nitpick at it some of them were a little undercooked but aesthetically i think the boulders were just really beautiful this round i this, I, this I completely round. agree and and these two boulders on the screen so the first one is is well actually it says right on the screen men's one and women's two <laughs> now aesthetically they both like are really outstanding but i got worried because i hate when you like a boulder looks beautiful but because of the monochromatic nature of it you can't actually tell a story so uh it didn't turn out this way on the black one but on the red one the women's one on the side there are a ton of screw-ons and like additional holds all over that problem in that big flower section and it's really hard to actually see those things and understand how you're supposed to move through the boulder when it's just red on red. And I was worried it would be the same with the black one. I thought there were going to be a bunch of screw-ons. It turns out there weren't. It was just like sheer edges on the black problem. Um, mm -hmm. So I was initially worried where I was like, okay, I see all these holds on the wall, all these volumes, but am I actually understanding the moves? Like, are there things I can't see because it's black on black? Um, so that always concerns me. A little bit it turned out to not be a problem on the black one but on the red one it was kind of it wasn't like my ideal thing i would have rather they make the screw ons black on top of the red holds so that you just have a better understanding of it yeah 100 percent. i'm i'm not uh, usually i'm not a huge fan of the monochromatic boulders uh i just like the colors i like the variety uh but something about that that men's one i think also maybe because the the volumes the squadra volumes were all so similar um it just it just kind of looked cool that it was all mm -hmm. it was all black yeah uh, but but that yeah de i'm in agreement with you not something that i want to see on every problem uh if if there are little jibs and screw-ons and stuff i would prefer that they be a different because i mean i would hate that a i would hate that a a competitor does not perform to their best on a boulder because they don't see a hold, like a small hold. Sure, you know? yeah. Um, that just, and I realize that's part of the game, but uh, I don't know, that just seems sort of like a, a cheap, um, I don't know, a cheap way to lose. <laughs> it sucks, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, I, my complaint is mostly from a perspective or a spectator perspective, um, but no, that that is a nightmare when that happens. Yeah. And it doesn't happen very – it happens more for mortals like you and me at the gym, whereas yeah. like these, these elite competitors, usually they, they are great at, at identifying all like the tiniest little jibs and stuff. But it does happen yeah. every now my, and then. My memory of it is a, a particular youth comp. It was like an Ontario Provincials and there was a little like you know two-screw foot jib. It was like a white hold on a gray wall and it just got um, like – shoe rubbered up so much that the last and again like it's a youth comp right so there's like 90 kids that probably climbed it back to back yeah. and the last 30 kids 
did not see this hold at all. And it's just like the saddest thing <laughs> you'll ever see in your life. Um, of course, that doesn't happen so much with the best climbers ever. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I was just kind of floating through these uh, through these problems. Yeah. Um, are there any you wanted to talk about? So we just talked about men's number one. Men's number two, I thought was like cool. Jan Hoyer's like beta of starting uh, using the sidewall kind of understanding of the rules was really cool. Otherwise, not a particularly spectacular problem. Like the hardest part was transitioning from the start where you're in like a four star like a, a starfish position, then you jump to the right to the two that you can see Yanji on right now. And then after yeah. that, you're just hauling on crimps up to a slightly dynamic finish. Um, it's it's too bad. The start was really cool. It's too bad that this boulder was a little undercooked. Yeah, uh, it was top for everybody. It was to, everybody topped it. Andra flashed it uh, because it was kind of a cool start. But just um, the fact that everybody got up with kind of relative ease, um, it was just too bad. It kind of took away something from it. But uh, yeah. You know, in looking at my my notes on the other stuff, so men's three was the slab. Here you go. Yeah, yeah. the slab. Um, this or was like sort of a slab under section, and then the upper move was kind of a little overhang. Yeah, this was gonna be my my favorite problem um, until I thought about how much joy I got out of watching Yanya number two. Where is this? Is number three? I got Jakob on this. This is Jakob's top. So I, this is like just what I love about boulders is okay. You have a start, a bonus, and a finish. There is one task to get to the zone. In this case, a traverse, and then there is one task to get to the finish, which in this case is like a straight up dino to a single hand crimp um that's just i like that about a boulder where it's discreet uh challenges i love it yep and here's the uh like the pistol squat sort of the quintessential slab leg movement there, just kind of standing up on that one leg um this was a good one i i would be impressed if you would pick a slab for your favorite just because um you know they're fun they're not usually the most aesthetic uh, boulders because they're so minimal, mm -hmm. right? Um, in in terms of what's on the wall, um, but uh, it did have a really neat jump here, and I thought that I actually was surprised that this jump didn't give people more trouble. Um, you know, it's Alexei Rubstov topped it, um, Jakob topped it, and Andre topped it. Um, so I guess it did give a little trouble for a couple guys, but, um, yeah, like only, only Andra flashed it. Um, yeah. but well, I think, I think like a lot of the people that didn't, they got screwed up in the traverse rather than in the dyno itself. Um, but like this one, sorry, I should just stop this video. Um, I, I think Anji, uh, Anji Payhark, he did not top it. He, he got a hand on the top hold and he just couldn't secure it. I think if I remember correctly, um, but yeah, you know, I it, for whatever reason it just it didn't occur to me to make the slab my favorite. But now that we were watching it back there, it was a it was a fun one. Um, I I actually also did like men's four, um, the, the you know the kind of the infamous one for for Andra. Uh, it, it had that sort of sequence where you're kind of swinging with your arms brachiating as the term is um which is kind of fun cutting your feet campusing up um i thought that was pretty cool too probably not enough to be my favorite but i did like it yeah i was kind of hoping you would see some beta get broken on this one um and I, a lot of people tried to skip over the swing like getting their heels up and stuff feet first things but uh yeah. no go um yeah in the women's we haven't talked too much about the women's and the brutal thing about the women's round was especially in the start of it was like just not seeing many tops through the first competitors um right like aside yeah. from like what fanny would come out second and then she would do really well but then you have it was it was a rough round in terms of there were some climbers that especially in the first couple of problems weren't going to get much done yeah. um first problem like pretty straightforward slab pretty cool um i think actually i'd just go back to it i think this was the one where i got really excited because evgenia kazbakova looked like she was going to be a contender all of a sudden right like yeah uh fanny and yanya flashed this <clears throat> and evgenia got it i think on her third attempt um but this looked really good for a moment i thought we were gonna have like a brand new medalist in this uh, event number two we already kind of showed this one this one looked beautiful and i appreciate that the root setters um were sharing space between men's two and women's two like they removed a bunch of holds from men's two to to extend the size of women's number two that's uh that's that's just like nice planning i appreciate that they gave themselves that space to create these like really bold problems 
Um, yeah, anytime there's like it, you can add to the to the horizontal progression, it's always fun. Like add a traverse section. Um, the space is always kind of an issue with that, so you can't always do it. But 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 I mean, look at the distance there from where the start is to where the top is, mm -hmm. right? You're like you're going like one, two, three, four, five. You're like sp spanning five panels, mm -hmm. um, and that's great. I, I love it because um, just vertical. If you're just doing only vertical progression, you're kind of missing out on a whole other plane, right? Like there's so much more movement you can employ. And uh, so it's cool that they did that. Yeah. Uh, women's number three, this was like pretty, like if you've been watching bouldering the last couple of years, this problem won't surprise you. It's basically like a vertical paddle dyno um, and then some some sketchy holds. Uh, so like more people top this than I expected. I thought this was going to be so hard that you'd only get like Yanya up there, but uh, Fanny and Mia and uh, and Julia topped this one surprisingly. Mm -hmm. um, but but there you go. And then this problem, I didn't. Uh, when I saw this problem on the screen for the first time, I wasn't psyched at all. Um, just because you could like when you look at it, you can tell there's a bunch of screw ons on it. It looked like it was just going to be like straight pulling. Um, I thought it would be too hard, though, but it turned out that it was actually the easiest problem of the round for the women. Um, how did you feel about this thing overall? Yeah, I thought it was – it didn't sing to me as much as some of the others. I don't know why it's hard because usually I really like – uh, boulders where you're you're using the arete for whatever <laughs> I don't know why I just always think that's kind of a fun thing to do um, and it's fun to watch uh, but I think it was if the fact that it was a little undercooked you know Julia Shannon D topped it Fanny topped it on her second attempt Mia Crample topped it with the figure four which was kind of exciting yeah um, uh, catch a cat it cat it topped it Kazbakova did not top it and Yanya topped it so yeah uh, yeah, yeah, just like you said, it's a little, it was a little undercooked, which mm -hmm. took away a lot, uh, a lot from it. Yeah. Um, but I, I, we might as well show it since we're on it. Like the, like I was saying earlier that I was, I was kind of bummed about the men's round and then the women's round was looking good. And then there was that moment where Fanny and Yanya were actually like kind of going head to head for a little bit. And then the moment that really saved the comp for anybody with a heart was watching Mia Crample climb number four and earn her first world cup medal this was her first i think this was her first finals her first world cup uh bouldering finals at the very least um but she was super injured right like she had a knee thing on she was yeah. clearly being extra cautious in the other problems and then on this what was it it was her it was oh she actually did flash it um we might as well watch this but this was like a heartbreaking so attempt and the camera guy is like, I hate weird angles that are just focusing on the face, but they fucking nailed it for this shot here. Just seeing her face as she's shaking out her leg. You're just like so on her side all of a sudden. And then the fact that she like comes into this position, goes for the figure four to get out of this. Yeah. Oh. Everybody going nuts at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to even talk about it because I kind of get lost in, in wanting to watch it. You know, it's one of those instances. Um, and we'll talk more about Mia's uh, perseverance, for lack of a better word, when we do the, the overall grades for yeah. the competition maybe. But I, this was a great moment too when she, I mean, she tears up, right? Um, it, I, it was this was a phenomenal storyline that, that just if you want to call it that i don't want to trivialize it but you know her being injured because if you go back to her attempt on the first uh, boulder her, the the slab there was she just she was very clearly in so much pain she was limping she was wincing after every attempt yeah and and that the movement of that boulder seemed to add insult to injury because there was this move where she kind of had to stab her, her left foot out and like put her weight on it. It just, and it, it, you just couldn't help but feel bad for her because it's like, she's already injured. And on top of that, she's having to, to do this, this movement where it's like accentuating the injury. Uh, and she did not top that problem. And, and Ch Charlie Bosco and Mike Langley were even wondering like, in this situation, is it better? Do you just call it? Do you just quit because you want to? You don't want to make the injury worse. You want to have a you know a long career or a long season. But Mia continued, and then just seemed to draw on some 
other power uh, to, to kind of rally. And I think people were just thrilled that she, at first, people were just thrilled that she was even continuing in the competition. And then over the course of the next few boulders, you get this idea, well, how, wow, she could actually even podium, right? And, and, then, um, and then she did, and, and by topping the last three. It's, that kind of perseverance through injury is not a storyline that we really see or have seen very often on the World Cup circuit. Uh, you know, every sport kind of has those moments where a competitor is injured, but they have this grit to keep going. Mm-hmm. Other than minor, other than like maybe some blood or skin injuries or something like that, we we just don't really see that that often. In, yeah, in- and I, you're like you're coaching uh, youth right now, right? Like you're actively yeah. a coach. I would have never recommended a climber go to finals or like like this would have, and it did drive me crazy. Starting from the first problem, I hate seeing climbers in a spot where they could wreck themselves more long term like uh mia's 18 years old she was born in 2000 right like she is at the very very early end of her career she's from a country with an incredible pedigree and there's likely amazing coaches and and like an excellent infrastructure around her she has so much potential for the future and and that like and that weirds me out. I get that maybe there's the pressure of this is my first World Cup finals. Maybe in your head you're worried this might be the only chance I get. Like, who knows? Maybe when Akio and Miho and Shauna come back and whoever, you know, maybe I don't get this opportunity again. Um, and maybe she honestly felt that she could get through it and, and not aggravate it anymore. But as a from a coach, I don't think I would have ever let them. I don't know. Maybe for the older kids, I would have let them use their own discretion and go into finals and just play cautious with it. But I'm, and part of me is torn because she did end up being successful. She did end up getting a medal. It ended with that beautiful moment at the very end on problem number four. But like, I don't want climbers to, to be risking that for, for something that early in their career. Yeah, it's a hard, is... like it's, it's obviously her own decision and it's between her and her coach and whatever medical staff they have. But I, I had trouble fully enjoying that moment because part of me was like, I, I don't know if this was the right choice, but. And that's a, certainly a valid point to make. I think it's, it's kind of like in other sports, like in soccer or football, the, at the end of the game, you know, the last play of the game or something, the coach comes up with a really risky plan and it's like if it works and they win the game mm-hmm. then he's a hero if it if it does not work and they and the team loses then it's all of a sudden that coach is Fired. an idiot for yeah. Co- for co- yeah for for choosing that play this case it worked out great because she ended up getting a podium she she kind of worked through the injury but if yeah i mean it, it's certainly something worth considering what if she had continued and you know, on some of those more dynamic problem, uh, those dynamic movements in like women's two or three or or four, certainly in four. You know, what if she had fallen when she was doing the figure four or something and landed on that knee, and and just compounded the injury and who knows, like torn an ACL or something terrible that would have really jeopardized her her whole rest of her season. Uh, then we would be singing a different tune and we'd yeah. be saying, you know, that was idiotic. She should have just left after that first boulder when, when she was wincing. Yeah. The, uh, the cynic in me after problem number four, as she was like holding onto the top, the cynic in me was like, Oh, she's going to fall and she's going to just wreck her leg when she hits the yeah. ground. Now um, you just worry about that, that risk all the time. Having seen it happen. I'm sure you've seen it happen too, where it's, you know, you get a successful top, then you fall and you wreck yourself on the way down. But um, yeah, yeah. And I did kind of, every time she would be midway up a, up a boulder and, and do a movement or a dynamic move or something and, and kind of miss it and fall, I would always kind of like, Oh, like I'd, I'd be a little nervous because I, I don't want her to, I didn't want her to fall. And, and you know, we have a, a more gruesome injury. Uh, it worked out fine. I think we're fortunate because of that, but yeah, valid point. You, you bring up a good point about, um, uh, from a coach's point of view, from a just a, a mentor point of view or, or a competitor point of view, would it have been the right thing to 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 step away and not risk further injury? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so at this point, I think we've we both talked about <clears throat> our favorite boulders and like I I don't know if I mentioned it, but the Mia Crample moment that we showed the video of that that was the moment of the comp for me. 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just like that was just an emotional release for everybody. I think everybody probably agrees that that was the, the like the the best part of the event. As much as obviously the ingredients for it are terrible, and you don't ask competitors to be injured just for the sake of a story, but whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I I kind of assumed that that was going to be the the moment of the comp for yourself as well. It was. I had so to be honest, I had I was when you when you asked me what my favorite moment was, I was going to say it was tied. Because uh, because it's so hard to compare the emotional um, kind of transcendent moment of Mia in that situation with the historic uh, situation of Yanya winning the season, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I did which wanna... nobody said. Like by the way, it didn't come up in the broadcast, and I like maybe everybody was just you know fired up about about the results and stuff but i don't think anybody actually mentioned or has talked about the fact that she did lock it in with that event like it's over she won the season she won the season she's the she's the 2019 <laughs> bouldering season champion regardless of whatever happens next week even if she doesn't compete at all in veil vale, if, yeah. if she gets you know gets a, a cold or the she has to go if she whatever. wants to pick up the medal like the the trophy yeah. or whatever she's got to go to veil vale to pick that up but that yeah. and the one the one thing that I, I put out in an instagram post was that she is the first woman now to have won a season in two different disciplines so she won the lead season uh three times um in the last like three years i think it was the last three calendar years um, I hope I have that right. Uh, and now right. she's won a bouldering season as well. The only other person that's ever done this is Adam Andra, uh, mm-hmm. who's won a couple lead seasons uh, and a bouldering season as well. Um, now, nobody's done it in the same year, which is why this year could be historic if Yanya manages to win the season for, for lead as well. She'll be the first person ever to dominate two separate disciplines um, in one single uh, calendar so that could like that could be whack I'm looking forward to that I think it is gonna happen I think so too I I, I, I mean if you if you if I was pressed to give a prediction I would think that Yanya will win the season for lead as well I don't know if she'll sweep it um, but maybe you know it'll be fun to see uh, I, I think it would be it would almost be irresponsible uh, kind of journalism from us at this point when we haven't even had one lead. You're yet you're the start. journalist. I'm not. I'm right. just a guy with a webcam. Irresponsible <laughs> uh, media analysis to, to before there has even been a single lead competition of the season to start saying yeah, yeah. she might sweep it you know but uh, but she, it's certainly um, prudent for us to predict that she might she could win the season. I think that's very likely. Yeah. Um, but you know it's she we had a competitor clinch the season title like that's a big moment any any season whenever that happens and so i i kind of was thinking well how can that not be like a key moment so that's why i sort of had a tie between Mm -hmm. mia's situation and and yanya uh clinching the season the 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 2019 bouldering title it's it's like they're both important in their own way and in in very different ways (laughs) yo so let's say you're telling like somebody has just discovered competition climbing and you have to explain to them the idea of a world cup a world cup season and a world championship which one would you kind of like use as the benchmark of of actual greatness like what one is like the the ultimate achievement so they they again this is an interesting question they're the a world cup a World Cup season, or what was the what was the other one? A, the a World, World Championship. Championship, which only comes every two years, but it is titled yeah. the World Champ. So I can't do my bunny ears in the camera. Any, like yeah. it is the event according to the name of it. It's the World Championships, right? Yeah, I would say. So one of the, I'll say this: one of my pet peeves is when people say that so and so won a World Cup when what they really mean is they won a World Cup event, mm-hmm. right? It's like there's a difference between winning the World Cup and winning a single event of that World Cup. Yo, is there um, though? Like, because I, I think of like Munich was a World Cup in itself and I think of Meringen as a World Cup in itself. So do you think the World Cup is the season and then this is like a World Cup yes. stop? Yes, because let's get metaphorical here. I think of it <laughs> as the cup you have inside the cup, you have all these single s- events, right? And so the cup is like the what cum- are you t- accumulation. Okay. That's how I always think of it. Um, but here's, to answer your question, I, um, oops, shake the camera there. I think the greatest of those three would be a World Cup season. And I'll tell you why. Even because, though you don't have to win a single World Cup event to like win it necessarily. Well, the, the reason I think 
it's more impressive is because I think greatness implies a degree of longevity. Now, to what degree, whether it's a season long or a 10 year career like Giant Kim or something, that's up for debate. But greatness, time should be a factor when you're considering greatness. Uh, a World Cup event, a single event, and the World Championships are both just single day events or, you know, single weekend or mm -hmm. whatever, if you want to combine all the, yeah. all the rounds. But those are, it, it's, at the end of the day, they're just, they're just one event. Um, and so I don't know how you can say, uh, I mean, think about it like this way. It, it, this isn't quite equal in a comparison, but it's like in a, in a sport like soccer or football or something, you can win a single game, a big game, or you can, you can win, you know, at the end of the season, you can you can win kind of the Super Bowl and have I, I don't know maybe I'm getting in the weeds here but um, I just think it's more impressive if you can have multiple events culminate with a victory rather than just winning one because on any given day anybody could win you know mm -hmm. I mean I mean you you look at we would say right now Yanya is the greatest woman boulderer mm -hmm. and yet if we were to have the world championship tomorrow what if she wakes up with a cold or something and just can't it's like she would not be the world champion does that mean that whoever is the world champion is greater than her no absolutely not not in this given you know this this given point in time i so, think like my my issue with it is as i i agree with where you're at like i think there is a lot of value in the world cup stops or what i call just a world cup um those are valuable you have a huge field there's a lot of history to them. The locations are just getting like better and better. And every stop has a story kind of in itself. The World Cup season is also an excellent thing. Like I really like that. The rankings have been consistent over decades. Um, and in general, it is truly like the best climbers that, that win those seasons. But the one that sticks out is just like a waste of time is the World Championship. And I bring this up because I've been going through like all of the results from the past. And I'm trying to think of some reason why the World Championship is any more important in terms of how I evaluate the strength of climbing's like achievements. And there's no reason for me right now to weight a result at a World Championship any higher than that at a World Cup. Like the qualification process is effectively no different. It is actually slightly different in that each country, there's like a, a different requirement to what your extra quota is, but you basically send exactly the same people. There isn't necessarily a smaller field at all. It isn't more challenging. There aren't more stages to it. You don't have to qualify through the season. Like it's just, it feels empty. I wish the World Championship because like the way I see it is I would like the World Cups to be their own thing. The World Cup season is an excellent all round kind of like it's like at the end of a hockey season, there's those like million different trophies they give out for like different accomplishments. Like, yeah, OK, that's great, too. But the World Championship, I want that to be a thing where it's like everything culminates to this. Everybody trains for this and it has to, like it takes more work and the results of it. I wish were more consistent with the actual climbers over the season. Like I it's. I don't know. It sucks that the that it can be just as random who wins a world championship as it is who wins a, a world cup. I kind of wish there was a more a degree of like more selective of who the field is. Like maybe, and again, I'm not making these as suggestions, but I wish the field was limited down to you know the top twenty climbers over the season, mm -hmm. rather than you know a total of thirteen boulders. Maybe I wish it was more boulders over more days. Maybe I wish there was cumulative scoring or something so that you couldn't just forgive failure and pass rounds. Like I, it just, I think the world championship is just like lackluster to me. And I haven't found a reason for me to care more about like, Hey, Petra Klingler, she was the bouldering world champion. Like whatever, like it doesn't make yeah. her better than the people that won more world cups than her that season. Yeah. I think it's almost like the name gives it a lot of prestige the and that's world it championships but that's it and and you know i i agree with you 100 percent. and i know this is the case because uh sometimes when i'm just like hanging out like this weekend in a hotel room or something i'll just put on uh, a, a stream an ifsc stream from from you know years ago just to kind of watch it in the background just for fun or whatever like half watch it you know on, on yeah. the screen while i'm doing other stuff and so i'll just for instance i'll type in like 2016 IFSC bouldering or something and I'll just like click on one of them without giving it much thought and it's it has happened more than once where I'm doing something like that and a couple minutes into the broadcast I'll think that I'm watching a World Cup 
event, but I'm like, oh, this was the world championship, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's like I don't even realize it at the very beginning because aesthetically it's it's exactly this, the presentation is exactly the same as a World Cup. Um, it's obviously the same names, usually the same competitors, the same field. Um, it's also always just held in the same season as the World Cup. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's, it's So it's very, yeah, it's like... Oh, that was... Why- the, sorry to interrupt you. The other thing is, half of the time, the World Championship isn't after the end of, like, the World Cups, right? Like, especially yeah. in the years where Munich was in August, you would still have World Cups for every single discipline happening after the World Championship. Yeah. Like, what is that about? That's not a thing at all. Yeah, I think it, it would almost be more interesting... Uh, if they would hold the world championships in like December mm-hmm. or something or January, like yeah. hold them at a totally different time, maybe even give them a different presentation. Maybe you could talk about giving them a little different format or scoring or something. Although I, I, I'm kind of a fan of consistency with format and scoring rather than than differences, but but just something to help differentiate them. If you do want to continue having a world championship, mm-hmm. um, I would. I, I'm the same way. It's uh, it uh, it's. I don't know. Um, I'd be curious to hear an argument from somebody who was, <laughs> who was like very pro World Championship, um, because it's, it just seems like this outlying event that is not. I mean, it's special because it happens every two years, but at mm-hmm. the same point, it's just kind of like, well, like why? Why do I'm, I don't know? I am partially talking out of my ass when I say this, but I, there are some. So like. Um, I've been looking through speed events and there was a speed world record that was broken at the world games in Krakow, uh, in 2017. Mm -hmm. Um, it was not a world cup. It was an event called the world games. And when you look into it, the world games is basically an Olympics for sports that are not in the Olympics. So it's like, it's the relegation stage for all the sports that aren't good enough to, to have an Olympic slot. Right. So it's an international event. Um, but one of the criteria for being a part of this event is that your sport has to have a world championship. So I think the idea of a world championship, like a culminating event internationally is important for acceptance in a bunch of these international, um, like, uh, sporting bodies or whatever. So I feel like it is probably more of a function of, you know, all sports have a world championship. That's really important. The unique thing is that we have so much international representation at the world cups across the whole season. It kind of makes the championship lackluster because we're so used to seeing everybody like all the best are at basically all of the events. So it, it, it kind of brings the world championship down in terms of importance. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And I'm not, I'm not advocating like, I like having a world championship. If like we said, if for the name, if nothing else, uh, but I, but I do wish there was some more differentiation between a world championship and just kind of your normal World Cup uh, competition. Mm-hmm. I wish there, I wish, I wish there would just be more fat, something that would be some gloss that was given to the world championships. Whether it's putting it at a different spot on the calendar, whether it's changing the format a little bit, changing the aesthetics, um, or hold it, hold it somewhere far away from anywhere where there's ever been a World Cup you know, competition or something like that. Right. Like uh, just hold it. Where Where should it go? (laughs) I I, I don't know. Like hold it in the case of the United States, like hold it in like Chicago or something, you know, like a, like a city that has never had. You know, and and like millennium park, that outdoor wall that you guys built, that would actually be beautiful, man. If the weather was good. Yeah. I mean, but as it is now, it's just kind of usually held at these places that have already seen world cup competition, Right. And I, I understand there's probably a reason for that in terms of fan base. But but, yeah, just do something to kind of make the, the world championships a little different if they if you have to have them, um, mm-hmm. give them a little more unique uh, identity. I just want it to be like a week long, seven stages of bouldering, like <laughs> seven different qualifying route climbs. Like all that, just like a just a nightmare of climbing to get to the finals. Like that would be sick. I'm um, I'm still on your thing. You mentioned this a couple comp a couple of episodes ago. How it, you know somebody should build a speed wall that has like eight lanes, <laughs> eight lanes, yeah, you know, like track track and field style. Yeah, but, man, like, that'd be broken. sick. Um, yeah, and, and <laughs> just like it'd be a way to just race through the qualification round. Just have you know eight people competing up doing a run at the same time. That'd be awesome. That'd you could, be- you could, you could run the men's and women's big finals and small finals all at the same time. That, 
Can you, you imagine? You could do a single race. You could award six medals in five seconds. That'd be dope. That would look. That would look really exciting. <laughs> having having all those people. I mean, it would be kind of a. It would be craziness. Uh, but, uh, I mean, that's how that's how most other speed sports are contested, right? Swimming, you have multiple lanes. Mm-hmm. Running, you have multiple lanes. Uh, horse racing, you have multiple lanes. Whatever it is, it's like it's 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 never just like a field a heat of like two competitors in sort yeah. of a tournament bracket that goes down you know so yeah, <laughs> yeah what, so if, what if, climbing uh, if, like, gym wouldn't want like what is that like 64 meters across or some <laughs> ridiculous shit or 64 feet i can't remember what is it eight feet wide or eight, yeah it has to be eight feet wide so like yeah, yeah 64 linear feet of five degree overhang 15 meter walls every gym needs that right well you would, that's perfect you would, I mean, you could have some interesting. It wouldn't have to be a speed wall all the time. You could put some holds on. You could put some volumes on it uh, to make it a little different. Um, you could hold <laughs> exactly eight kids in a birthday party, just <laughs> auto blaying all of them. Well, if if anybody from like Walltopia or EP is watching and they want to construct this uh, this epic speed wall, eight lane, ten lane. Walltopia speed wall. is exactly the company that would do that. Like whatever ego there is behind that company. I'm sure if they like, they're the I yeah. I, I, the I can imagine their personality being like, yes, we will build the biggest speed wall, and they would just be psyched about that. Just putting yeah. Bulgaria on the map. I met a bunch of the Waltopia guys this weekend. They were really cool. So if they're watching, they're totally yeah, they're totally cool yeah. guys. But I, I think there's a lot of ambition in that company. Maybe I'm just talking about the leadership. But yeah, they yeah uh, yeah. Well, well, which is good, right? Like we want people that are ambitious and and creating like wild stuff that seems wacky at first but and stays wacky and doesn't and ever might. ever actually achieve them yeah and were they so okay they were totally off the world cup topic yeah. but very briefly you were at the cwa and i saw they they had a, a panel still on the harmonized wall system yes. um did you happen to go to that one if not don't worry about it i didn't go to the panel but i did talk to the wall some walltopia representatives about mm-hmm. the harmonized wall um and it's it is a cool thing for the future of climbing. I don't want this. I'm not. We're not sponsored by Waltopia or anything like that. But let me say this: one of the things that I've thought for years that would be really fun is if you could watch the World Cup competition, and then you could go to your local gym and hop on the boulders. Like they would have the boulders set. Um, just the exact same boulders and angles from the World Cup competition, and so you could you could try them out yourself, right? Because it's like I live in the United States. I can't. I'm not in Munich. So how do you how do you define fun? Because I would like I would touch the start holds, like I would like wipe my hand on them, and I'd be like, well, that was fun. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's true, but it but it would be interesting because I think one of the questions, if nothing else, one of the questions we always have when we're watching these these. World Cup events is how difficult are these? Because it's hard to tell when someone like Yanya cruises up something, it makes it look really easy. Uh, it, it's it's hard to tell. Is this okay? Is this like V five? Is it V eight? Sure. I don't know because she made it look super cruise control. Uh, so the harmonized wall system from Walltopia, what it is for people listening, it's it's like you a gym can buy a um, a, a certain section of wall. Um, that they that the gym you know you can put it in your gym but then a gym somewhere else can buy the specs that that exact same section like a, a section that's cut to those exact same specs and put it up in their gym yeah and it's basically like when you, when you're designing a gym they basically have this uh, a large set of predetermined angles right so you can choose from these and take as many of them as you want and the idea is that you will now have a bunch of angles in your gym that also exist in gyms around the world with the same bolt hole layout. And so you can hypothetically start sharing like root layouts and things like that. You can start to have the exact same roots at different places, presumably if you're using like HRT holds or whatever, um, whatever that uh, <clears throat> Waltopia is selling. So yeah, it's a, it's a cool idea. I don't know if it's ever like actually going to become a thing. Um, like I'm sure there, there are a bunch of gyms using it already. Um, which is fine. Like they're good angles. There's nothing wrong with the angles they're selling you. Like they're, I don't think anybody has complaints about uh, those for the most part, but the practicality of having the same holds as everybody else. And I think Waltopia would like to sell 
a gym worth of holds from their HRT collection to every gym they build. Yeah. That would be really cool for them. And they'll give it to you at like a huge discount, right? Like they will slash the price of their holds if you fill your gym with these holds so that you can then set with the same crap that, you know, the other gym that got, you know, shystered into, into, into building it did as well. But I, I don't know. I don't think it's like that likely to actually become a really big thing. I, I There are a lot of... Um things that complicate it as you pointed out like the fact that there's so many holds you know if i want to if i want to hop on even if my gym has the same angles the same wall paneling as the the wall in munich um that doesn't mean that they have all the squadra holds and all the yeah know, all, the, all the volumes it's like you need to have the same holds as well so it's yeah. like having the same wall paneling is only part of the equation um but in theory, though, like, like theoretically, it's a it's a really awesome idea to think that a gym in one corner of Canada could have the same problems and the same, you know, the same boulders as a gym in like, you know, the southern United States or something. It's just mm -hmm. kind of fun. Um, I, I think it's it's almost like it's almost like a gym version of a moon board, right? Where like yeah. the moon board, you set a, a, a sequence, you set a problem on it and then somebody on the other side of the world can set that same problem um, and try it out. It's just kind of that same thing, but on a larger scale with, with a gym wall. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that's I, what it is. Ideally. Yeah. Yeah. I think it just like for me, number one, it takes out the best part of root setting, which is creating your own stuff Two, yeah. I don't think it's actually going to function that well, unless you have just HRT holds for the most part, which in North America, you probably don't have the aesthetic sensibility to actually enjoy those holds. Like they're not very, in style here i don't enjoy a lot of them some of them are cool but most of them are like not very relevant in today's like climbing um you can't use some classics from um <clears throat> that have been around forever they're just not in the family right it just it doesn't seem practical it doesn't seem like it can keep up with the innovation that's coming from places that aren't waltopia um i don't know it, it, it just doesn't seem like it's going to be able to keep pace with the amazing stuff that comes out of other places they're not going to be able to standardize it it brings up an interesting question too of of route setter intellectual property, right? Like if you if you set at, at you know at Joe Rockheads or something, if you set uh, let's say you had the harmonized wall and and you set a a really cool boulder, well you're getting paid as a route setter to to in in essence to come up with that and to put it on the wall. Um, then if a if a gym across the across the world sets that same problem you know shouldn't should you get a little payment for that like it's your creativity it's your it's your vision um yeah i obviously it's it like that's probably a long way off but especially but if you have somebody who's like a noted uh route setter like chris danielson or somebody right where it's like this is his career he he's you know uh in in a lot of ways he's sort of got like a he's, he's like genius level in route setting yeah he's got a brand um, himself yeah yeah it's like well, I, shouldn't he be getting a little something if gyms all over the country are, are taking his 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 creations? Uh, I I don't know. I mean, that's just an interesting discussion that, that can be had. If mm -hmm. the harmonized, not maybe not Waltopians specifically, but just if that whole concept of having walls around the country having the same the same routes. Um, yeah, interesting. If I if I set a problem on the harmonized wall and it, like I'm assuming there's an app that goes along with it, right? Or like some system where you can see like climbs that other people have set. If yeah. people like somehow are clearly showing interest in it, they better be like reducing my subscription fee because I I imagine you have to like pay some some fee maybe to like get access to the library. That just seems like what they would do. Um, uh, I hope they would like give a little back if you have a super popular problem at the same time root setting has never been defined by like or at least your pay as a root setter i don't think has ever been defined as as the reach of your problem i don't think there's many setters that get paid more based on like the the impressions outside of the gym i think we all get paid pretty much by time right yeah um, unfortunately yeah well yeah. it's better than being paid by like root which is. hopefully is but i i don't think that's ever been uh i don't know like from my music background and talking about payola and just how, how, you know, broadcast rights have changed. I, I'm not sure if it's a parallel thing where the, the number of times that it's used after you create it is, uh, it, it'd be interesting oh. if you, it, yeah, if you'd ever want to have somebody, uh, from Waltopia on, uh, on a plastic weekly, it'd be interesting to pose these questions to them. 
Yeah, I would. That's actually a, a good topic to put down for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we are we have strayed far from the World Cup yes. thing. Let's wrap it up just by grading this comp, and yeah. then uh, and then we'll shut her down. Let me see if there's anything that I wanted to anything else I wanted to mention. There was one other thing very briefly. It's extremely pithy. I'm so glad we're done with Euro comps for a little bit because the like Euro clap is finally over. I don't right. have to listen to this every time somebody's <laughs> climbing. It drives me crazy. Yeah, it's um, it, yeah. I, <laughs> <clears throat> um, That's what I think of you, Europe. A couple other things. So I th we already touched on this, but I just think it's worth mentioning that I think Fanny G. Bear was really kind of the unsung hero of this competition because she stuck with Yanya in the scores for the finals. She was right there. She, you know, she kind of kept the pressure on mm -hmm. Yanya, right? Like if, if uh, by topping and then forcing Yanya to have to top. If Fanny had not done that, if, if Fanny had not been there... Um, this competition, the women's division in particular, would have been just so less, less, less watch oh, in sorry. the finals because it would have been such a such a blowout. Yeah, you know? I, I that's actually a really good point, and I was ignoring it as well. You're totally right. Like sandwich between Yanya's like given success and Mia's, you know, story from this weekend. You yeah. do kind of lose the fact that Fanny climbed extremely well, basically was the one person to actually challenge her. That is a great point. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to ask you, so we only, we, we have Yanya with our champion, our women's champion has been determined. We're, we're getting to the tail end of this, this season. Mm -hmm. And so it's not over yet, but I think it is, we are at the point where we can start looking back at it on the, on the whole. And so I'm wondering if there has been anything this whole season that on the men's or women's side that has kind of surprised you oh that's hard man yeah i think i don't know if surprise is the right word but i think i've been well okay yeah i think that the big surprise is how easy it looks like yanya's success has been and I, if I've been surprised by any part of it, it's been by the lack of a field below her that keeps on like genuine pressure. Um, and maybe that's just because I'm remembering like my, like the last time I paid super, super close attention to the World Cups was like 2012 through 2015. Um, and it was largely the Anastur era. And again, you'd always see Puccio and Akio and Katka. And uh, um, like it was that time, Yuli and Melissa. And I, I, you come to this season and Shauna's like not showing up to half of them. And Nikio is really just missing from this event. She's still there, but it's really just Nikio. And I think I was just kind of like, I was really hoping that there would be this new set of climbers that I'm seeing all the time. And maybe it is just too early. Maybe it is Fanny who did uh, come third place in the season last year. Uh, maybe it is Ketchikadic. It is this like Slovenian set of people, Futaba. Like it, maybe it is these people. And I just haven't recognized it yet. Yeah. But I was kind of hoping that I would see Yanya, Miho, Shauna, Akio, and then a couple others come up. But it's just I felt like a little bit underwhelmed by the lack of those. Like I don't know. That's that's the part that's bothered me the most. And I think if if I sound overly um, like dismissive of Yanya's accomplishments, I think it's because I'm disappointed that I don't feel like there is like a a genuinely like strong field of challengers underneath her. I think it's coming. I think they're not there quite yet. I think it's people like Mia Crample, even like Oceana McKenzie, who had that good showing at the beginning of the season. I think those people are coming. I just think it's like we're a year or two years before they're really going to hit their stride. Um, because, you know, right now, it, it, if you think of who are the major players right now, especially in the women's division, in addition to Yanya. Yeah, it's like these veterans, right? It's Shauna, it's uh, Miho. She's been around for a couple years. She's a little younger, but nonetheless, like Miho, Akio. Um, it's it's just kind of these names that we've known for a while, for several seasons. And I think probably next year or the year after that, that's really when we're going to start seeing these, like in mass, these new younger, younger uh, names popping up. I don't know if we're there yet, but that's a good point. Mm-hmm. That you make. Yeah. Um, Is there anything that surprised you or anything noteworthy about the season overall? The, the thing that surprised me was is just how the depth of the Slovenian team. Okay, um, yeah. You know, because I, going into this season, we knew that Japan was going to be, you know, just this huge 
massive team with depth. Um, I kind of thought, actually, so I actually wrote an article about this in Jim Climber Magazine. I actually, going into the season, thought that South Korea might be the, the team that had some depth because they had Seoul Sa and Jung Won Chan and a, and a bunch of others. I think they could still shine maybe in the lead in the lead um, season. But uh, on the whole, Slovenia just kind of, I don't want to say caught me off guard, but um, I, they just, they've really impressed me. It's like there's Yanya, there's Yerne Kruder, there's Mia Krampel, there's um, Vita Lukin. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were like, in the semifinals and finals, there were a, a ton of Slovenians in this uh, in this competition at Munich, and I don't think this was really the outlier. I think we've seen consistently this whole season, the Slovenian team just really flex flex its muscle collectively. I, so it's it's interesting you say that because like I for the current day it doesn't surprise me too much. I happened to go to the the 2015 World Championship and that was when like this cohort of climbers especially the female climbers were still youth climbers for the most part right Mm -hmm. um and you're like holy crap like they have like an entire like collector's set of these like upcoming female climbers so that part doesn't surprise me but now that i'm going through all the past results in my head, I think I always thought like, oh, Yanya is kind of, you know, she's the lucky offspring of this fairly small country. But of course, you remember that there's like Mina Markovic and um, yeah. uh, of course, I'm forgetting all these people. But as you go further back. Maya, Maya Vidmar. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Katya Vidmar as well. But as you keep like Vidmar. pushing back further, you realize that Slovenia has been like one of the contender countries the entire time. Um, yeah. And that's something that it took me doing this research to realize like, oh, I've, you know, I've thought about Japan, I've thought about Austria, I've thought about France. And those have been like the three countries and Russia, if you look especially at like speed climbing as well. Um, But then you kind of do this and you realize, oh, Slovenia has been here the entire damn time and they should be considered like one of the mother countries of competitive climbing as well. Like there, it's unreasonable. Yeah. Yeah. It's just been, and that's a good point. It's like you're... I say I'm kind of surprised, but then when I look back at the results for several years, it's like, oh yeah, well, there's Slovenia's been a consistent powerhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, if nothing else, these these recent competitions have just underscored that, and it and it really was magnified this competition because Japan did not send so many yeah. competitors. Yeah. Um, and so that's just been uh, something that I've noticed on the whole this season was like Slovenia. You know, they have a lot of people. They have a lot of great climbers in Slovenia. They do. Yeah. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, let's grade Grades. this thing. Yeah. Let you me look first. Where, let's see here. So, where are my grades? So, this is going to be. Uh, we're probably going to vary <laughs> quite differently. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I gave it an A. And. The reason I gave it an A, there's a there's a couple reasons. First of all, um, and I know we're flawed because we never actually set out like some criteria. No, for, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so I gave it an A because first of all, the crowd, which we have not mentioned, yeah, and I know we kind of said the, the Euro clapping thing, but like the energy of the Munich crowd, they it never disappoints. This is how a crowd in an ideal world. This is how every crowd at a competition climbing event should be. They were enthusiastic. They were. I, I think Charlie Bosco said something like at the end of when Mia like topped that last boulder, they were like chanting her name. It's mm-hmm. like, when does that ever happen in like a competition, cl- like people chanting, you know? Yeah, in, man. In um, so the crowd was awesome. Uh, I think we had some interesting, we had a lot of layers to it. There was the competitive storyline with Yanya dominating. Um, there was the sort of unexpected storyline with, with Andra not winning. Uh, not being able to top that last boulder. So all the competitive juice was there. But then we also had this underlying story, this emotional story of Mia Crample, who it's like, even if you were watching this and you did not know anything about competition climbing in terms of the rules Mm -hmm. or anything, you would still enjoy that narrative with Mia because you'd be able to understand she's, she's, she's injured and she nonetheless like fought through it and got, got to the podium. Um, So I just thought that there were so many, so many layers to it. I, I admit that it might be maybe my A is a little bit too too gracious because there there are some knocks. There were some undercooked boulders uh, on both the men's and the women's side, and I do think it's worth like it, it does count for something that the Japanese team, you know, the elite Japanese competitors were not there. Like mm-hmm. that's unfortunate, and that should detract a little bit from the event. But uh, but I don't know. I just really enjoyed it. I I. 
maybe maybe it, I'd be hovering in between like an A minus and an A, but but I'll say an A. I <laughs> I feel like you've affected my grades now that you've said all that stuff. So like when when Adam didn't win, I was like, screw this. This is a D for me. I was like genuinely not happy. I wasn't having a good time. And then by the end of the comp, after the Mia thing and 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 just like the, the podium atmosphere, I had gone like the other way completely. Because um, you're still writing off that emotion of the of the Mia thing, which it's rare that, you know, I think the closest thing was uh, was like Andra's I, like still the top moment of the year would be Andra on the crack and the like triumph of that moment was still like the most emotionally impacting thing that we've seen this season. But the Mia is, is the next best thing. And I was still riding those emotions at the end of the comp. And so suddenly I was like in a territory as well. Um, but you, so like I've been, I was thinking like, okay, should I grade this on the way I felt at the end of the comp or should I like grade it as an average? And I kind of decided on an average. So I was going to say a B coming into this, but you mentioned the crowd actually. And the fact that like through the broadcast, like the mics of, of uh, Charlie and Mike were like clipping the entire time, right? Like the, the audio is too hot. My guess is because in semifinals, it was a quieter atmosphere. And when they like went to finals, the audio didn't get adjusted for the fact that Charlie and Mike were having to speak louder, right? Like it was a yeah. loud as fuck audience. And that's actually, I forgot that at the very start of the competition, when they were calling the athletes out for preview, I kind of like, I kind of lost myself in how amazing that was. Um, as I was watching the comp, I was thinking, okay, Yanni's going to win this. I was being all like intellectual about like, does it matter if she wins like with this adjusted field? But then the magic of the crowd kind of, kind of shook me. And now that I'm reliving that because you brought it up now, I'm kind of thinking like, I almost want to say an A minus just because like atmosphere wise, or at least how it translated in the broadcast was probably like the best atmosphere so far. That's the atmosphere I want at every comp where you can hear like the, the crowd getting with everything that happens. Um, but I'm still pissed about zones mattering more than. <laughs> than yeah. Flash. And, and, no, you know what? I'm going to say a minus cause that's petty. And I've talked about that before. Um, yeah. This Munich rocks. They did an awesome job. Um, they did I, an awesome job. Yeah, I'll go with an A minus at the end of it. And you know what's interesting too is like <clears throat> the fact that you mentioned that you had some like emotional swings during the competitions. Mm -hmm. Like you hated it, you gave it gave it a D, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you came back. Like that's what that's what epitomizes a great sporting event, sure. right? Like you're, you're watching hockey or soccer or something, and like the other team scores. And you're like, oh, screw this. You know, like, oh, I hate this game. <laughs> but then fair. your team comes back and you're like, oh, yes, this is the best game ever. Like, th those emotional swings, as much as they maybe each individual one, like, it might be a low point on the whole, they really make it a fun viewing experience. It keeps you watching so, for sure. Yeah, that's watching. totally fair. Yeah. I think your your point about the zones is valid. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's just I, I kind of just ignored it because that's something that's not going to change. Um, and, and it's like, it's no fault of this competition, Munich, you know, uh, that, yeah. that, that I, I don't know. Um, but point well taken. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It was, it was a good a awesome comp overall. Yeah, like I just really enjoyed it. Definitely re, uh, worth rewatching. Um, yeah. And especially, yeah. Anyway, I was going to make a joke about the IFSE trying to copyright strike video clips. So if you <laughs> please watch the IFSE stream, we're yeah. Don't, yeah. uh, yeah, everybody I'm just worried that people like watch this and then don't watch the IFSC stream. You should watch the IFSC stream if only so that we can say that us doing this video promotes more people watching the sport. Shout out to beta root setting, by the way, actually, yo, go to, if you don't subscribe to beta root setting, go to their channel and subscribe to them because they do awesome videos. And I hope they get to do more because they do like a genuinely unique take on, World Cup boulders and root setting, and you learn a lot from it. It is very educational. They do a great job of it, and I really hope they get to keep doing that. Uh, so go subscribe to them and leave them a message saying they're doing a good job, because they are. Yep. And uh, yeah, we should, yeah, if anybody wants to, like my recommendation would be first watch the competitions themselves, the whole live stream, and then, you know, beta root setting's great. There's a, on bouldering is another um, great resource for people wanting to just kind of get more content related to all this comp stuff. So 
After you watch the four-hour bouldering finals and the three-hour semifinals, yeah. spend another hour and a half with me and John because yeah. that's obviously what you have to do with your day. Okay, let's wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. I appreciate you joining from like a hotel yeah. room. Um, I hope you had fun this weekend. Um, uh, to you watching, obviously, subscribe to us too, not just other channels. Uh, subscribe to this and leave a comment if you have any any uh, questions. Uh, John loves to answer your questions and I love to hear your, your criticisms because I'm new to like producing these kind of shows. So please leave a comment. We appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you in two weeks for Veil, the final boulder season or final boulder event of the season. Um, yeah, it's going to be a good time. Are you going to be available to, to do video for that one? Yeah, I don't know. I was wanting to go to Vail. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to do it. I kind of spent a lot of my travel money this weekend here. So, um, so I might, it might just be back to the normal, uh, the normal format, the normal time and all that. So I've been, I've been like debating it as well. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we'll talk. Maybe we'll see if there's some some reason we should go or not. Yeah, well, but. and it's also, I mean, the the atmosphere, if I was a fan, I would I would definitely want to go. I mean, mm -hmm. I do want to go, but like in terms of reporting on it, it's I wonder if it's almost easier just to watch the live stream like in private in, you know, like Yeah. Down. Straight up. It's so. not like it's uh Anyway, well, yeah, we'll talk about this later. Thanks so much for watching. Yeah. Leave a subscribe and a like and a comment and all that stuff. We'll see you guys in a couple weeks.